If you are new to our channel, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Well, Holly, let's go to the IV Organics, the Win-Win Plant Guard hotline and bring in our next guest. Uh, Joel Ample is one of the country's most recognized and trusted personalities in gardening and green living, and his passion for living a greener life is evident to his nationwide audience um, on Growing a Greener World on PBS. He's also an author, blogger, and more. Welcome to the program, Joe. Hi, Holly. Good morning. Hey, Joey. Hello. Thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule to join us on the program and share some of your wisdom with Holly, myself, and all of our, all of our listeners. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, Joe, for people who's tuned in to PBS is Growing a Greener World, they've seen you've got a lot of raised beds, and you're very successful with those raised beds. Why did you choose to go to raised beds versus just taking the tiller out in the back uh, yard there and, and digging up a spot of, the, uh, of ground? Well, I really love the idea of engineering my soil to create the ideal growing environment. And although uh, the soil that we have that's native to Georgia, which is really primarily clay, it's slow draining and it's heavy and it would take a lot of soil amendments. And then maintaining those beds from year to year is extra labor. And once the garden is established and the beds are in place, I really don't want to come back in until each year because I think that uh, I subscribe to the no-till approach. So by designing raised beds, I can initially start with the perfect soil. I have a recipe that I love to use. And then just top dress that with a little bit of compost and um, enjoy just a more controlled growing environment. And I love the aesthetics of a raised bed garden environment, too. And so I'm partial to that. Plus, it, they're 18 inches tall, so I can sit on the edge comfortably and do my weeding, and I like that, too. Well, when, with the raised bed, you know, people say, well, what's the best type of gardening? And I'll ask him, you know, well, what do you want to do? Well, number one, a raised bed is uh, going and tilling the, the soil up, assuming you have good soil, and, and the soil tests come back, you know, have toxicities. It is the most affordable way, but it's an investment for the raised bed, and it, in the long run, it pays off for the return on investment that you put into it. Yeah, you put money up front, but what you get out of it, because you're putting perfect or near-perfect soil compost in there, is well worth the investment. And that's such a great point. I definitely have a significant investment on the front end of these raised beds, but I haven't put a penny into them since then to maintain their shape and their integrity and um, the payoff. I've already had the payoff on it, but I get really consistent results. And also, Joey, time is money, and the more time you have to spend maintaining an in-ground bed and reshaping it and weeding it and bending over, I mean, there's a lot to be said for that. And these raised beds are so much more low-maintenance than anything that I would have in-ground. And I'm not opposed to in-ground gardening. I love mounded raised beds in-ground. But for me, the best overall situation was raised beds. And raised beds are really popular and it gives people an opportunity to grow in an environment where they may not otherwise be able to do so because their soil is so hard to work in. And so the raised beds just make that easier. And last point on it is for somebody that has maybe some physical limitations, a raised bed allows them to get that bed up higher to where they can more easily get into it and work, uh, work the garden better. Right, and you've been on this program, and I agree with you. There is no wrong answer or right answer to how should I garden. It's specifically targeted to your needs and your situation. Uh, that's what you need to go with. Just because Joe said something or we said another thing doesn't mean that's the right answer for your particular backyard. Right. Exactly. Especially if you're doing it year after year. Now, most people, especially in the Midwest, you know, it's Labor Day weekend, it's the unofficial end of summer type mentality they're starting to wind down their gardens maybe they don't want to grow fall crops um and as you know as they're putting what when they're putting into their beds what they think about what is better in your opinion aged cow manure aged horse manure or some sort of plant-derived compost uh first choice would be plant-derived compost and would not be opposed to some sort of aged manure and i would definitely offer cow manure over horse manure because horse manure can have some um, really nefarious ingredients in it, such as persistent herbicides. Throughout the country, it's pretty common that farmers that uh, manage their fields for the hay that they harvest, they apply a broadleaf herbicide that does not break down for several years. And gardeners unknowingly can take that horse manure because the, the uh, herbicide is still intact, and they can put that composted horse manure in their garden, and next thing you know, they have, they've uh, ruined their soil with this pesticide or herbicide that doesn't break down. So you have to be careful with that, and, and cow manure is unlikely to have that herbicide in it. But if you really want to play it safe, um, composted organic material is going to have everything you need for your garden soil, and there's no risk of those other things. 
Now, as we clean the garden up, uh, Holly and I will do this later on where we bring a, a lot of material, organic material in uh, from fall to get ready for winter. What are the, some of the biggest mistakes that gardeners make that we should not be doing when cleaning the garden up? We shouldn't be too tidy. A lot of us really want to have a very clean slate when we start the next garden. But by uh, by removing everything, and that is all the plant debris that's in the garden, we're removing a lot of uh, beneficial insects that are overwintering. Yes, there are potential some pests that may overwinter in that area as well. But we're absolutely, when we remove everything, we're removing some very important beneficial insects that we need to appear next fall, early in the season, and so by removing maybe just the obvious things that have um, damage or pest diseases or uh, something like that or, or diseases or pest damage, remove those. But uh, be okay with the fact that you leave some organic material behind because when you do, you're also leaving behind some overwintering beneficial, which you need to be there early next spring. Right, and when you say remove some of the stuff, I, I think powdery mildew plants. I would I would get those out and put in the trash. Right. But other yeah. other things, uh, you know, just dead plant debris, yeah, there's a lot of beneficial insects that you don't know that are there that make a tremendous difference on the positive for your garden that whenever we so, – and you've seen it just like we have. They, they rake it out, clean it up just so, you know, it looks like they're ready to lay carpet down because it's so <laughs> pristine, and it, it really is hurting them in the long run. Absolutely. That's exactly right. Now, do you cover, uh, in the winter, do you recommend putting some type of organic material over top of the soil to keep the, the soil from being exposed all winter long if we're not growing? Absolutely. You want to protect that surface with organic material that will eventually break down and help improve the soil and add to it. But you don't want to leave it exposed because when you leave it exposed, you're, you're doing a lot of things to that soil that um, doesn't prepare it for next spring. And you're also subjecting it to, to runoff or compaction, uh, and, and just you don't want to do that. So put a layer of mulch on. If nothing else, put a layer of mulch on, or shredded leaves is my favorite thing. So there's lots of options, but the one thing you don't want to do is just leave it completely bare. Yeah, the neighbors uh, at the at the large garden, I think they all realize that either we're crazy or we must know something because uh, we, we spend days and hours bringing leaves, and last year we put 2,000 pounds of leaves on the garden Untreated wow. leaves, and by what August or by June, Holly, we didn't even know we did a thing because it all had broke down and fed the soil. Perfect, perfect. Now, if someone wants to expand their garden or have recently bought a house, wants to get ready for their spring garden, what can they do right now, whether it's raised beds or in the ground, to prepare for that? I think the first thing is is to prepare. Make your plans. Think about what what do you want to grow? How big is that space? Where are you going to get the material for that? Um, do you need to add soil? If so, where are you going to get it? Are you going to buy seedlings? Are you going to start seeds? Where are you going to get your seeds? Um, if you're going to start them from seeds, what material do you need to buy or borrow or find to help you get going? Because what happens is we get closer to growing season, which seems months away now. As we get closer to it, it starts to come at us really fast, like a fast-moving freight train, and we're not ready. And so the best thing that we can do to be ready is to do that planning now and take advantage of this downtime and, and figure out all our sources and all our needs and the garden design and, like I said, uh, the size of the beds and what we're going to need. And, and put pen to paste paper and plan it out now so that that doesn't sneak up on you. Next thing you know, you're going to miss that window of opportunity next early winter. And, and based on what you're wanting to do, it's the fall time. What's garden centers wanting to do? They're wanting to get rid of their materials and items, mm. so they're bargain basement pricing that you can stock mm. up now uh, yeah. and get ten times what you would normally buy for you know ten times saving compared to one whatever it was uh, would be in the spring. Great, yeah, I'm a big fan of getting good deals, and that's a great point that you make there, Joey. They want to clear out that shelf space and make room for their seasonal items and they're willing to practically give away that stuff that you can easily use next season good and, point and if your husband or wife is anti-gardening just explain how much money you're saving now by doing it <laughs> rather than buying it and spending all that money in the spring <laughs> there you go uh, joe you you've done nine seasons of growing a greener world on pbs people all over the world know who you are it's syndicated in what is it 29 countries now, something like that? 30-something, yeah, 30-something. And, and people think that, you know, they tune, turn on the TV and they see 
pristine everything that Joe Lampo had, never has a mistake. What what are some mistakes that you face or problems or plants that you just are like, I'm, I cannot make this thing grow? Challenges that I have, I, I embrace challenges. I look forward to them. It helps me become a better gardener. But every single year I have challenges, and it's always Mother Nature first and foremost. You know, every year is different. And so I'm always just trying to, you know, move with the punches. But um, it's being proactive to try to anticipate what kind of conditions you're going to have so that when those things happen, the damage or the challenges are fewer. But, uh, for example, to answer your question on the things that I just don't grow very well, I don't go squash. I don't grow squash very well because of the heat and the humidity and the squash bugs and the squash vine borers. That, they're, they're pervasive in my garden down here. And I'm not around as much as I'd like to be to manage and observe and, and prevent those problems from occurring. And they take up a lot of space for me in those raised beds. So there are other things I'd prefer to grow. And so I typically don't grow squash, although I did it this year, thinking that I might have different results. And I didn't have different results. It was a disaster. I mean, I still got great fruit, but I had all the pests and issues that I always have. And so I tend to not grow the things that I don't have great success with, and that's one example. But bottom line is uh, I, I like to make mistakes, and I look at them as challenges and opportunities. And as long as I'm learning from them and I, and I don't purposely make those same mistakes again, then I'm happy with that, and I embrace everyone that comes my way. And and you're just out of a, uh, outside of Atlanta, Georgia. So when you say down there, uh, I want people yeah. to be aware of where where you're yeah. located. At. And, right. and maybe you might be in the same situation we are. We can't grow cauliflower or broccoli to save our lives, mm-hmm. but we've got friends who are very prolific in it, just a few miles away from where we're at. Wow. Uh, yeah. So, so it's very very unique. Um, with the raised bed that you have, and and this is a, a general question, not necessarily des- designated to your particular garden. Is it less likely you're going to deal with insects in a raised bed versus a ground garden, or are we going to deal with the same problem everywhere? It's just going to be easier to um, be reactive to it in a raised bed. I think we're going to deal with the same problems because the insects don't care whether it's you know in ground or raised bed. They're going to they're going to find it. They have lots of amazing ways to to locate those favorite plants. And so I don't think the raised bed is going to cut down on whether or not they show up, but I do think it makes it easier to manage them once they get there, just because I think we have greater access and easier visibility because the plants are closer to our eye level, so we're able to see some. I mean, the diseases and pests are closer to our eye level, so we're going to be able to identify those issues. And so for that reason alone, I think the raised beds have an advantage. And we want to point out that you are an organic gardener, and we had Lee Reich on last week, and he's an organic gardener. He's been featured on your program, and he said the same thing that you will probably say about avoiding toxicity products in the garden or around the garden because they can potentially stay in the soil and be detrimental later on down the road, just like you talked about the compost. I just don't think you need to use them. I think if you let Mother Nature do what she does best and be patient, the problems are going to take care of themselves. Um, yeah, maybe you can intervene it from time to time and be a little proactive, but basically design the pest out of your garden. And you don't need to do that with any sort of chemicals. And the interesting thing is, even when we use you know benign or organic uh, options, such as insecticidal soap, that's still non-selective, and it doesn't know the difference between a, a good pest or a good beneficial and a pest. And so we just really need to be more thoughtful about if and when we're going to use anything at all. But I'm a guy that does not use any synthetic chemicals whatsoever in my garden because they do stick around and they oh, tend to be non-selective. And I think the number one uh, uh, advice is know what the problem is. Don't think that you know. Actually, we've got the technology in which we're hand, all in our hands all the time. Identify what the problem is and then make an educated decision what is best to either de- uh, resolve the issue or control the issue. That, that's the most important thing. Before you control or treat anything, you need to know what you're treating and the best method of control for that one thing that you're trying to control, treat. So, yes, please, if, if you didn't hear anything else I said today, that is a perfect thing to, you know, take away from this conversation is know your foe before you begin to treat it. Fantastic. Now, how do we get a hold of you and find out more about you and all of your great information? Well, joegardener.com is a great website that allows you to, to watch our 
videos and listen to the podcast. And if you wanted to contact me, there's a contact link right there on the home page or any page on, on that website. And it's kind of a one-stop shop for whether you like to listen to podcasts or watch videos or read great show notes and blog posts. JoeGardner.com is where I would have you go. And if you wanted to learn more about our television show, GrowingAGreenerWorld.com is its own website, and you can watch all the past episodes and related information there. Well, Joe, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your very busy schedule to join Holly and myself and all of our listeners and, and enlightening us and educating us on some garden techniques that will help us better in our backyards. It's my pleasure, Joey and Holly. Thanks for having me. Have a good weekend. Thanks, you too. Absolutely. And Thank you for checking out the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. For more, go to the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com for full link in studio video and podcast replay of season one. Season two underway and added weekly. Tweet us at TWVG show or hashtag TWVG to be part of the program.